This meeting is being recorded. You might want to turn off. Um, you know, I might be able to do it. Okay. I just turn off the chime sound for when people enter. Oh, yeah. cool. Um, okay, so welcome everyone to lab meeting. This is a, a little bit of a different lab meeting because it's going to feel oddly formal. <laughs> uh, Juana and I are going to go through a presentation um, that we put together on how to do some basic dyadic data analyses. Um, and I think probably what we'll do is kind of start with doing the, the workshop component of the whole thing, go through our material I'm going to open by just going over some basics um, conceptually. I'm going to show you some data and some syntax in SPSS, and then Juana is going to take over to show you how to do everything in R. And then probably once we're done, we can stop the recording and then just have like a more normal chat about things that you guys probably wouldn't want the whole world to potentially hear. So does that does that make sense? Does that good for everybody in terms of the format? Okay. So we're probably going to want to take questions kind of after we've gone through the material. Um, just in the interest of time. So um, with that said, um, I need to find my PowerPoint so we can get started. And so Wana, it looks like has sent out everything for this workshop. It's also, Wana, is it available on our website or? Not yet, but I'll, I'll make it available after the, the workshop is done. So it's gonna be on the, the resources tab where we have like all of the other workshops. And right. then this video probably will be uploaded somewhere. So the resources tab on testthewestlab.com, um, you'll be able to get access to um, all the materials. So I have to actually manually share my screen first, right? Yep. Okay. So maybe um, before we do that, I can just give everyone like a brief description of the data set that we're using. Um, or do you, do you have that in the slides? I do, but go for it. Go, go ahead and you, you might want to just give like an overview of, you know, what these data are about since they are your data. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, uh, some of you might have heard, um, this is data from the study that we call the tutor study, uh, where we basically had uh, pairs of students and tutors come into the lab and they conducted a tutoring session uh, that lasted about 30 minutes. And um, at the end, we asked them a bunch of questions about their partners, about the overall like interaction with them. And so in this data set, what we're going to look at is um, their overall impression of the tutoring um, session. So um, I think the variable is actually called overall tutoring. Um, and obviously, the higher the value is, the more satisfied they were with the um, tutoring session. Um, and then the other variables that we're going to look at um, are uh, a measure of social status, uh, which is more specifically the uh, MacArthur social, well, MacArthur subjective social status ladder. Um, so it's this ladder, which you may have heard of, um, where people have to rate themselves um, on the rungs of the ladder from one to 10. Uh, depending on how they see themselves um, compared to like the rest of society. Um, so that's just a little bit of background. Um, this is what the study was about. So um, we're, the main variable that we're looking at is their satisfaction with the tutoring session after the, the session ended. Good. Thanks, Juana. All right, so what I want to do here is um, I'm going to open with some really basic conceptual things. Um, this is a super truncated version of um, a presentation I've given before that's also um, on the website called Agena Summer Workshop, which is kind of a more elaborate version of dyadic data analysis. But um, this presentation kind of assumes you already have some back or background knowledge on what dyadic data are kind of coming in. And so what I'm going to do is start just by going through some definitions, kind of anytime you learn a new statistical strategy or you learn about new type of data, you learn some new terms that then people will use um, to describe the different kinds of variables you have. I'm going to talk about the concept of non-independence. This is sort of the critical, um, you know, underbelly of a dyadic analysis. So why do we, why do we care about worrying about, you know, treating diet as unit? Well, that's because we have this issue called non-independence. Um, and then get really concrete into the data structures, how we um, can analyze multi-level or uh, dyadic data using multi-level modeling. 
and then kind of briefly introduce you guys to one of the basic models for dyadic data analysis called the inter actor partner interdependence model. So um, the first thing that you might be thinking about when you collect dyadic data is um, who are the two people that are going into your dyad? So there's an issue in dyadic analysis called distinguishability, which basically means that when you collect a sample of dyads, those two members can either be distinguished from each other on a meaningful trait or factor or not distinguishable from each other on this meaningful factor. And it sounds kind of like a really kind of obvious thing, like, oh, of course I could easily figure out whether my two dyad members have some factor that can distinguish them, but it can get a little bit messy, especially when you start thinking about all the different ways in which your two people could potentially be distinguishable from each other. Um, so in the dyad literature, here's just a couple examples of dyads that are distinguishable from each other. So this includes gender and heterosexual couples. So imagine that you're a relationships researcher. There's a lot of this research going on right now in the time of COVID. I'm getting lots of alerts um, online telling me to you know, take part in a study where they're interested in how two people are you know, living and breathing at home all the time. And maybe that study is focusing on heterosexual couples. So there, if you have a man and a woman and each dyad has one of each, then those dyads would be distinguishable from each other. Those dyad members would be distinguishable from each other based on gender. Um, in the patient caregiver literature, you might not care about gender per se, but you actually care about who the patient is and who the caregiver is. Um, in the lab, we do a lot of research on um, looking at cross-race interactions. So maybe in every dyad, you have a white person and an Asian person, or a black person and an Asian person. There, so long as all the dyads have the same competition, composition, then race would be a distinguishing variable. Um, in the case here, the study that wanted to just describe role um, is our distinguishing factor in our tutor-student dyad. So every dyad has a tutor and has a student in it. And so basically the way that you can kind of sum this up is thinking about whether there can be a systematic ordering of scores from the two dyad members that can be developed based on the variable that distinguishes them. Um, this needs to be something that's conceptually meaningful or theoretically meaningful. So you imagine the case that you're doing a study in the lab and you don't have a meaningful variable and you decide like whoever's taller gets to be, you know, that's the distinguishing factor or whose birthday came first or something like that. That's certainly possible, but it's not super interesting or meaningful in that context to distinguish your dyads, um, your dyad members from each other based on that variable. Um, so indistinguishable dyads are dyads where the two partners can't be distinguished from each other based on a meaningful variable. Um, so for example, let's say you're doing a study looking at gay couples, say all men, um, you have two men in a dyad, it's arbitrary who you would then label as like partner one and partner two. Um, or twin studies that look at identical twins, same gender friends, um, or maybe you're doing a study where in some conditions, both dyad members are in the same exact experimental condition. Okay, so um, Kate and Juana and I have been involved in a lot of these kinds of studies um, where maybe two people do like a computer task um, and they're both doing this identical computer task before they then kind of get together and interact with each other. Those two dyad members would then be indistinguishable. So in this case, there's no systematic ordering or meaningful way to order the two scores. You know, you're going to have to analytically give one person a one and one person a two um, in terms of, you know, their, their participant number, but it's totally arbitrary who gets labeled what. Um, so you might be thinking, well, what happens if I have a data set that kind of has a combination of the two of these things? Say, say you're doing a study looking at um, friendship development and half your friendships are cross-race. Um, you know, there's a black person and there's an Asian person. And then maybe the other half of your dyads in your study are same race. They're two black people or two Asian people. Well, what happens then? Um, well, analytically, you know, what you're going to have to do is treat them all as indistinguishable. This doesn't mean you can't look at race um, in your model in kind of more complex, um, nuanced ways, but it means that um, at the most basic level, analytically, you're going to have to either treat your dyad members as all distinguishable or treat them all as indistinguishable. Um, so if most dyad members can be distinguished by a variable like gender, but if you cannot, 
then we can say that the dive members are distinguishable. No, we can't. So you have to, it's, a, it's really like an all or nothing thing. And this might sound scary, like what am I going to be losing from this? It's honestly not a big deal because where, where this is really going to affect your analysis is when we look at the error variances for the two dive members, okay? So the, the interesting stuff, kind of the meat of your theoretical question, like, you know, what if, how do cross race friendships differ from same race friendships? Those kinds of questions you certainly can still look at regardless of whether your dyads are distinguishable or not. Um, so in addition to this issue of distinguishability, um, when we do dyadic analysis, we also talk about the different kinds of variables that we have in our models. Um, so one type of variable that you can have as a predictor variable is what's called a between dyads variable. So this is a variable that varies from dyad to dyad, but within each dyad, all individuals have the exact same score. So you can imagine the case that um, you're studying friendships and you ask them the length of the relationship. How long have you guys been friends? Now, people usually differ in their answers, but we're gonna assume there is kind of one right answer of how long they've been friends. So that should be a between dyad variable. Um, in, in homosexual couples, um, same, you know, same gender couples, gender would be a between dyad variable because you're both always the same gender. Um, or sometimes we might actually compute this variable. So maybe we compute a measure of similarity between the dyad members. How similar are they on some, you know, measure or difference? So in Juana's study looking at, um, you know, social status as a predictor of outcomes in these two relationships, maybe we believe that it's the similarity in their status that really matters. So we compute some sort of score that's the same for both dyad members. Um, and this is called a level two variable in multi-level modeling. Um, sometimes we have within dyad variables. So these variables vary from person to person within a dyad, but there's also no variation on the dyad average from dyad to dyad, okay? Um, so percent talk time, reward allocation if each dyad is assigned the same total amount, so basically the two scores, X1 plus X2, equals the same amount or the same value for each dyad. And if in the data there's a dichotomous within dyads variable, then the dyad members can be distinguished from each other on that variable. Okay. Um, but the most common type of predictor variable we have in these models is what's called a mixed variable. So this variable varies from both, both between dyads and within. So you can imagine that you have a dyad and the two members have two different scores on something, say different ages and married couples. And there's also no, there's also variation across dyads on the average score. So say maybe I'm, you know, 37 and my partner's 41. Okay, well, our average is going to be different than say a couple where one person's 40 and one person's 60. Um, and individual difference predictors like, I don't know, satisfaction, um, you know, income at the individual level these kinds of predictors often tend to be mixed variables. Um, for the analyses that we're going to be talking about today, the outcome variables are mixed variables. So each dyad member gets their own score, and that score varies across different dyads in the study. So for one a study, if you rate how satisfied you were with the tutoring session, maybe I'm a five and maybe my tutor is a three, um, and so our average is a four and we have two different scores from each other, you can imagine another dyad that's a one and a seven or you know, any kind of combination of these different, these different values. Um, so the mixed variables tend to be the outcome variables, um, at least in the analyses we'll be talking about today. So um, the next thing I wanna talk briefly about is defining, measuring, and dealing with non-independence in dyadic data. So in general, when two linked scores are more similar to or different from two unlinked scores, the data are non-independent. And the strengths of the links is really the measure of that non-independence. And so the reason why um, we, have to, we have to use dyad as unit of analysis is because our dependent variables for the two people tend to be correlated with each other. And we need to adjust for the correlation between these two things. This isn't always the case. Sometimes you might think there's going to be this huge correlation and say how satisfied the tutor and the student are with this, the tutoring session. And then you run the model and they're not. But, you know, usually we tend to, you know, find correlations between two dyad members if the processes we're looking at are really truly dyadic processes. And so this is really kind of at the heart of why we need to use multi-level modeling to analyze dyadic data. Um, so what happens if you, if you don't use dyadic units? So imagine the case that you've collected 40 dyads and instead of running a dyadic analysis, you just run an ANOVA on those people and you treat those 80 people as if they're independent from each other. They're, you know, they, they're not in dyads, they're just 80 people instead of 40 dyads. 
Well, what you'll notice is that the effect estimates in your model are unbiased. So this is the part of the model when you're running um, a fixed effect. So these look a lot like regression coefficients on standardized beta weight or B weights. Um, these things tend to be unbiased. Um, it's the standard errors of the effects that are actually biased and they're not necessarily biased in one direction. So sometimes they're too small, sometimes they're too large, sometimes they're actually hardly biased at all. Um, you also have a loss of degrees of freedom. And so when you violate non-independence assumptions, it's not like you know exactly what the consequence is going to be. Sometimes there's no consequence. Sometimes your p-values are too small and sometimes they're too large and it kind of depends on the kinds of variables that you have um, in your model. So um, you know, I can post some additional slides on this if you guys are curious, but the direction of the bias depends largely on the direction of non-independence. So if the non-independence is positive, the link scores are more similar. Um, if it's negative, that means the link scores are more dissimilar. So one thing I forgot to mention is it's certainly possible to have a negative correlation between two people. So, you know, imagine that we're playing a game of chess and I win and you lose and the researcher asks us how satisfied we were with the game, well, chances are the two people's scores are going to be negatively correlated because there's a winner and a loser. Um, so that's certainly possible. So for a between dyads variable, link scores are in the same condition and within the dyads variables, link scores are in different condition. And so the direction of your bias depends on whether the non-independence is positive or negative, and whether you have a between dyads variable as a predictor or within dyads variable as a predictor or both. Um, I should mention now that each effect in your model can have a bias associated. Not necessarily the whole model. Okay. So this is kind of just a little breakdown of what that, um, what the effect of ignoring non-independence would be. So if you have a between dyads variable um, and positive non-independence, then your test is too liberal. If you ignore, if it's negative in between, too conservative. If you have a positive interclass correlation, so the two people's scores are correlated with each other positively and it's within, too conservative, negative, too liberal. So this is all to say that I don't think you guys should make up a little chart every time you do a dyadic analysis to figure out what the bias would be if you ignored it. I mean, you can certainly kind of run the ANOVA or the regression, compare it to the dyadic analysis and see. But, you know, kind of the, the overarching theme of this is it's complicated and you don't really know what the cost is going to necessarily be because you don't necessarily know how highly correlated those two scores are. And, you know, it depends on the kind of predictor variables that you have in your model. So this is just a lesson to say, just, if you have dyadic data, analyze the data dyadically. There's no cost to doing so. Um, so as seen as bias and significant testing, but also analyses that focus on the individuals, the unit of analysis, lose much of what's actually important about the relationship. So you are losing this like ability to look at whether adjusting for dyadic processes change different fixed effects and so on and so forth. Um, so then what, what are you supposed to do? I'm giving you this lecture telling you that, you know, you're a bad researcher if you don't analyze your dyadic data um, using um, appropriate approaches. And so what we're going to talk about today is how you can then use multi-level modeling to go about um, analyzing dyadic data. Um, and I'm going to open first just by showing you what this looks like at SPSS, kind of walking through the code, and then have Juana kind of take over from there. Um, so if you guys want to open your email, you can. You certainly don't have to. Um, I'm going to open up a data file called TSD person period pairwise um, that's then going to show you what the data actually look like. Um, so here's our SPSS file. And what I want to really kind of highlight to you guys, I'm actually going to move this dyad variable up here. There are a couple different variables. Okay. Um, so the first that you're going to see here, and this is in variable view, is dyad. Okay. So if we go over to our data view, um, what you're going to see is that each line um, in the data set is a dyad member. Um, you know, so each line is a person. So if we have dyad 22, that's the first two lines here. We have a person one and a person two. Okay, and these actually correspond to the roles of tutor and student respectively. 26, the same thing. Okay, so a dyadic data set is called a pairwise data set because each person um, kind of shows up twice in the data. Each person is a row and they have their own variable, so their own ID, say right here. But then next to it, what you're going to see are their partner's variables, okay? So sometimes we call this a checkerboard structure. 
where here's, let's say I'm person one, I'm role one and die in 22. My ID is 25. My partner's ID is 26 and it's right next to me. And so the actor variable is the one with the underscore one. And then there's a partner variable, my partner score right next to it. We're going to actually see this occurring for all of our variables. So here's, this is going to be our ultimate dependent variable here called overall tutoring. But what you can see here is that for person one and dyad 22, um, here's their ladder score on that measure that Juana described, and here's their partner score. Now, if we go down a row, we're still in dyad 22, but now we're at the second person within dyad 22. So what you might notice here is that their ID is 26, and then next to them is their partner's ID. So when I said this is a bit of a checkerboard, this is what I meant. So it goes 25, 26, 26, 25. So the actor variable and the partner variable right next to it. So effectively, everyone's data is actually in this data set twice, once as an actor and once as a partner. And you can see this kind of going through here too. So if you remember this person up here, um, their ladder score was a six and their partners was a seven. Well, if we go down one row, this person, the partner is seven, and then you can see the six right next to it. And so, you know, we could do this for the whole data set, but what you'll see is for all of the variables, we have them both for the actor, so say my own ladder, and then right next to it, the partner. And the actor variables are always underscore one, underscore zero, zero, and the partners are always underscore two, underscore zero, zero. Um, so this is what our basic data structure looks like if we have just one time point of data for our dyads. You should have as many rows in, in your data set is there are number of individuals, okay? And then within the data set, you need a variable like this one called part num that distinguishes persons one, two, one, two, one, two. Now, as I mentioned in the part on distinguishability, this variable could be something theoretically meaningful. So here, part num actually corresponds perfectly to role. So this is person one is the tutor and um, person two is the student. Um, but let's say you had indistinguishable dyads or a combination of the two you still need a one and a two, it's just really arbitrary who you've assigned. And I promise you that won't be a problem later on analytically when we start to look through the data. So um, I wanna show you guys a couple of things before we kind of jump right into the multi-level modeling component. The first thing is if you open up this file called dyadic analyses, put a couple comments in here. Um, when you structure your data into a dyadic data set, and we actually have some webinars already on the website um, for this that um, Key Sources has created. So re I recommend you look at those if you need help with that stage of things. Um, the first thing that you're gonna wanna do is run some descriptives on your variables, okay? And what you're gonna do here is you wanna make sure that your actor and partner variables have the same means, because remember, it's actually the same data going into them, but you don't want them to be perfectly correlated. So if they're perfectly correlated with each other, chances are during your um, structuring process, you somehow accidentally made two variables the same. Um, so it's certain, that's certainly a possible outcome. But what you want to do is make sure um, that, and I'll show you this in a second, that you have the same means and standard deviation. So remember here, we have this variable overall tutoring for person one and person two, but everyone's data gets treated, everyone gets to be an actor and a partner in the data set. So um, we have the exact same means and the same standard deviations for this. Um, this is our ladder measure that we're going to be using as a predictor. Again, the same means and the same standard deviation. So that means we have a uh, correct, so far, um, evidence indicates that our data set is structured correctly. And then the next thing I like to do is to correlate them, just to make sure they're not perfectly correlated so that you don't have, you didn't accidentally make your actor and partner variables the same variables. Okay, so here's my ladder, here's my partner's ladder. They're not positive, they're not correlated very highly. It doesn't actually matter what the correlation is, you're just looking for it to not be a perfect one correlation. Here's my overall tutoring, let's say I'm person one with my partners is 0.069, okay? So, you know, again, not a perfect one. So that's what we're looking for here. Um, the next thing you're gonna wanna do is um, kind of follow the same basic procedures you would if you were running a regression analysis. So a multi-level model is basically the same thing as a regression. So you're gonna get out on standardized coefficients. Um, kind of the one nice thing about a multi-level model is you don't have to create any interaction terms ahead of time like you might have to in regression. You can build it right in. I know this is something that some of the older programs you had to do manually. Um, but one of the main things that you will need to do is actually center your predictor variables. And so you're gonna wanna grand mean center them. Okay, so what that means is you're gonna to wanna to take the mean of the entire sample, 
and subtract that off of the variable so that zero now refers to the mean of the variable. So if you remember when we looked at our um, output here, we can maybe go back up here. Um, our latter mean was 6.67. So technically, I think on a one to 10 scale, people put 6.67 for that mean. So we're gonna go ahead and subtract that mean off of both the actor ladder, so say my ladder if I'm person one, and then also the partner ladder for person two. We're gonna to wanna to create those variables ahead of time, just like you'd center in any kind of regression model that you'd wanna do. Okay. And then the next thing we're gonna do is um, create this mixed syntax here. So what I'm gonna do now is kind of switch back um, to this PowerPoint because I kind of walked through what each of the lines mean here. Except for, for some reason, I skipped the first one, but I'll go ahead and explain that to you guys. So this is what your syntax looks like. Ignore this red fixed box for now. Or yeah, and look at this very first line. So mixed, everything in all caps is a command. Okay, so everything using lowercase letters or maybe a combination of lowercase letters and not are variables. So mixed is a command and it's telling us that we want our dependent variable to be overall tutoring. So person one's tutoring. And then you're going to see this word with. And so after with is where you're going to list all the variables that you're going to eventually put into your model. This isn't yet your model. It's just the variables that you're going to want to include. Okay. So the reason why this is on a new line is just because ladder now is long. Um, and the reason why we're using with is because our, our variables that are coming next are either continuous or they're dichotomous and coded one negative one. So I'm gonna pull up the syntax and kind of explain what this means to you um, and what an alternative could be in a minute. Um, but what you wanna make sure here is anything that comes after the word with is a continuous predictor, or if it's a categorical predictor, you've coded it one, negative one. Say you had a different predictor in the model. Say you had race and you have three levels of race, black, white, Asian. Instead of the word with, or in addition to the word with, you'd write the word by, B-Y, and you list the variables after that. So um, continuous predictors or one negative one categorical predictors come after with. Anything else categorical with three or more categories goes after the word by. And so you would just write by right here. Okay. The next line is your fixed statement. So this is really kind of the meat of your model. This is where you're going to write out what you want your model to look like. So this would be like a regression equation. So here, um, we have ladder now. So this is basically asking the question, does my score on that um, social class ladder predict how satisfied I was with the tutoring session? And then I've also included this, this variable role. So this just distinguishes between tutors and students. Um, and then I wanna look at the interaction. So if we just looked at the main effective role, are tutors or students overall more satisfied with the session? And then the interaction term. Um, does, you know, my social class predict my tutoring satisfaction differently if I'm a tutor versus a student? Okay, so this is just like a regular regression. You have two main effects in an interaction. Okay. The next line is print solution test cov. This just asks for output. Okay, so if you didn't include this line, you would run a model and you would just not get any output. So you just want to always include that there. Um, the next line, and I apologize for the change in font size, um, this repeated line is really where the dyadic analysis differs from like a typical regression. So here, what we're telling it is saying, first off, we have a variable that distinguishes our two dyad members from each other, and that variable is called part num. So that's the variable where there's a one and a two in every dyad, okay? Next, it's telling us that our subject, our level of analysis is going to be dyad. Okay? So it's going to know that it wants us to treat dyad as unit, and then how is it going to know who the two partners are in the dyad? It's going to use this variable part num. Okay? And then the last thing is the covariance type. And what we're going to use for now, and I'm going to talk in a minute about why, is something called CSR, compound symmetry row. And this is going to assume um, that the two dyad members have an error variance, but it's going to force them that, that error variance to be the same for the two people. So effectively, although we have a distinguishable dyadic data set, it's going to treat them as indistinguishable. It's going to say, give me an error variance for whoever is a person one part num, give me an error variance for person two, but then force those two things to be the same as each other. We're going to test in a minute whether that's a good enough idea, but that's basically what that's showing. Okay. So 
I don't know why there's a five here, just ignore that. So if we wanted to say, change this covariance type to treat the two dyad members as distinguishable, if you want to separate error variances for the two levels of partnum, you would just change the CSR to CSH. Okay, that's effectively the difference between running a dyadic data analysis with distinguishable dyads versus indistinguishable dyads. It really just comes down to that one letter. Compound symmetry heterogeneous. Give me a separate error variance for person one is part num and person two is part num. So that's your crash course in the basic syntax behind a dyadic analysis. Um, what I'm gonna do now is actually show you guys what the analysis looks like, okay? So this is the same syntax that I had in the PowerPoint. This is using CSR, compound symmetry row. Let me just go ahead and run this and show you what the model looks like. So we have 51 dyads. Okay, that's our, our um, subject line. I'm gonna ignore some of this stuff for now and just kind of get right down um, to our fixed effects. Okay, so this type three box is just gonna give you the p-values for all of your effects. I'm just going to give you your numerator and denominator degrees of freedom. You're going to notice that the denominator degrees of freedom are fractional. That's normal if you have um, mixed predictors. Um, yeah, and your F test as well as your significance level. So here we have now our fixed effects. Oops, sorry. And what you can see here is we're going to interpret these just like we would an unstandardized regression. Okay, so our DV is overall tutoring. The intercept refers to the mean level of tutoring when everything else in the model is zero. That's why we wanted to center these variables. So on average, people are pretty satisfied, 5.96. Apologize for the lack of significance in these effects. I told Juana it didn't matter if they're significant. We could still um, use them to kind of teach the basics. So what we see here is a positive effect of ladder. Okay, and so you, the way you would interpret these effects is you would write out a regression equation exactly like you would um, or, you know, in an Aiken and West kind of procedure. And I'm going to show you in a minute what this would look like in Excel. But we see there's this positive effect. So the higher up you go in ladder, you know, for every one unit increase in the ladder, you grow up um, 0.039 points in your satisfaction with tutoring, although not significant. Here's the main effect of role. Um, it's negative, and I, I know that um, students are, are coded negative one here, so you would just multiply this by negative one to get the effect for students. You multiply it by one and add it to the intercept to get the effect for tutors. I'll walk you guys through how to do this in a minute. And then this is the interaction term. What I want to show you guys here is this value right here, 0.0873. Okay, so this is the intraclass correlation between the two dyad members and it's actually not significant. So here we could we could you know go ahead and not use dyad as a unit of analysis and run a regression equation although I wouldn't recommend it but it wouldn't it you should get parallel effects because you actually don't have significant non-independence. Um, you know what we tend to do when we have a dyadic data set is we have a lot of different models that we're running and so sometimes that dependent variable might have a significant intraclass correlation and sometimes it doesn't. I'd recommend kind of just always using this process. You're not losing anything um, by using diet as unit analysis, but this is where you look to see what that intraclass correlation is. Okay. Um, this is the exact same model, but we're gonna replace that R with an H, and I'm gonna show you guys the difference between, two, between something we just saw. So you're gonna notice the fixed effects are almost identical. They might actually be identical. But what we have here now is um, we're treating the two dyad members as distinguishable from each other. So we get an error variance for person one, and then we get an error variance for person two. And what you might notice is that these, these two numbers actually look pretty different from each other. It looks like whoever's labeled as part number two has much more error variance in their measure of their tutoring session than people who are part num ones. So this might be some kind of hint to you that you might wanna treat these dyads as distinguishable from each other because it's looking like they don't actually have the same amount of error variance, that we, we might not wanna force these two things to be the same. But nevertheless, you can do a test to see which model actually fits your data better. The one where you treat them as indistinguishable, so that CSR model we just ran, or the one where you treat them as distinguishable, that CSH model. So anytime you have a distinguishable dyad data set, you can test whether the data, the partners are empirically actually distinguishable from each other. And you can do what's called a test of distinguishability. 
Um, and it's a really simple test. All you have to do is run the two models I just ran, and we're just gonna look at a new place in the output, okay? So if we go back to this indistinguishable model with CSR, um, we're gonna look in a, a part of the output called the negative two restricted log likelihood. Don't ask me why it's called that, I have no idea, but we're just gonna go do that. Okay, so this is a CSR model. Right here is the negative two restricted log likelihood. You're gonna go ahead and write this number down on a piece of paper, right? Indistinguishable 264.119. I think I might have actually written that right here. For some reason, these numbers are different. Don't ask me why. Um, I'll go back and check. Okay. Oh, I think I might have run this on the model that had partner in it. Okay. And then you're gonna do the same thing for the other model. Okay, you're gonna write down that negative two restricted log likelihood, 247.419. So 247.419 and 264, and then you're gonna calculate the difference between those two variables, okay? So we could retype these for what we just got. I did this on the model that had actor and partner in it, so these numbers are slightly different. But if you take the difference between those, what you're looking for is a difference of greater than 3.841. Okay. So if we go back to them one more time, we have 264 for this model, and we have 247 for this model. So 264 and 247, okay? So is that difference greater than 3.84? Yes, it is. And so we can conclude that it actually worsens the fit of the model to force those two things to be the same. Now you might be wondering, Tessa, why 3.84? What is magic about 3.84? Well, what I just showed you guys is what's called a chi-squared difference test, okay? So what we wanna do is look to see if we change one thing about the model, and all we did was change, we made one additional parameter, we made one additional error variant. That's a change of one degree of freedom in that model. And the critical chi-square at one degree of freedom is 3.84. So that's why we care about this number. Does the negative two log likelihood increase by more than 3.84 by you know, forcing that constraint, forcing those two error variances to be equal? In this case, yes, it does. So then we can conclude that it worsens the fit of the model to force them to be the same, and we should be using CSH. Long story short, we should be using CSH for this model because we do have heterogeneous error variances. So this might have been a little bit fast. I understand I kind of rushed through some points, and then I also used a model that didn't correspond to the numbers that I just showed you, but hopefully you can go back and watch this. Um, we also have a handout, and I think I've talked about this in one of my repeated measures of dyad books or chapters. Dave Kenny has a lot of resources on this, showing you how to do this test. But it's a really simple test of just changing CSR to CH, CSH in the model. So once you know how to do a really basic dyad analysis, then you can do all kinds of fun things with um, the kind of models that you run. And the most classic model that we run in dyadic data analysis is what's called the actor partner interdependence model or AKM. So this is a model that simultaneously estimates the effect of a person's own variable, their actor effect, and the effect of that same variable put from the partner, the partner effect uh, on an outcome. Okay. And so the actor and partner variables are actually the same variable, but they come from different persons. And so when I showed you that data set where we had the actor variable and the partner variable next to it, we both had ladder scores for both people, but what is my own ladder? And the next suit is my partner's ladder. Okay, and all individuals get to be treated as actors and partners. So the data requirements for this are that you have two variables, X and Y, and X causes or predicts Y, and both X and Y are mixed variables. So both members of the dyad have scores on X and Y, and that varies both between and within dyads. Okay. And then the actor effect is the effect of a person's X variable on, the, on their own Y variable. So one example would be the effect of patient's depression on their own quality of life. Here, the effect of my own ladder on how satisfied I am with the tutor. Okay, and then you can have these effects from both people. So tutors can have an actor effect and students can have an actor effect. So both members of the diet have an actor effect. The partner effect is the effect of a person's partner's X variable on that person's Y variable, or alternatively, the effect of a person's X variable on his or her partner's Y variable. So the effect of a patient's depression on their spouse's quality of life, um, the effect of the student's ladder on the tutor's perception of how well it went, the effect of the tutor's ladder on the perception that the student makes of how well it went. And both members of the diet have a partner effect. Okay. 
So with distinguishable dyads like the ones we have here, there's two actor effects. So you get an actor effect for tutor and one for student and two partner effects, a partner effect from tutor to student and also one from student to tutor. Okay. So this is what our model effectively looks like. Although when we analyze it using multi-level modeling, we only have one DV, but by using moderation, we can break it down into these four paths. So the effect of the tutor ladder on the tutor's ratings of satisfaction would be the tutor's actor effect. If I'm high in social class, am I more satisfied as a tutor? If I'm a student, if I'm higher in social class, am I more satisfied? And then we can look at the effect of the student's own ladder on their tutor's rating, and then the tutor's rating, the tutor's ladder on the student's rating. And it all gets estimated at the same time in one multi-level model. So what I'm going to do now is go back to that SPSS file. Um, and I've put down a couple different models here. So here, um, this model is the actor and partner model. Okay, so it starts on line 52, expanding the model to include partner ladder. And what you'll see here is we have the actor effect is ladder now. So the main effect of the actor effect is ladder now. So this is the actor's own ladder on their rating of the tutor, how well it went. And you know it's the actor effect because they're both one. And then down here, ladder two is the main effect of the partner effect. If my partner's ladder affects my rating. Now, because we have distinguishable dyads, we actually have two actor and two partner effects, one for tutor and one for student. And the way we get out those coefficients is by interacting our actor and partner effects with role, respectively. Okay? So this is a moderation analysis where we have our two main effects, our actor and partner effects. We've included the main effect of role, and then we've interacted our actor and partner variables with role. Okay. So then, you know, how does one go about kind of understanding what these effects look like? Well, you can write out the regression equation, and you can use Aiken and West, and Juan is going to show you a much snazzier way of doing this. Um, to, to then figure out what those graphs look like. Um, I think I'm in the right spot, although I want to, because it's so graphs, okay. So what I've done here is gone old school and shown you guys how to break this down, okay. Um, so what you would do is you would make a separate little Excel spreadsheet for the actor effect and one for the partner effect. And then you're going to just pull those numbers from your output. So this is the intercept, this is the mean, this is the main effect for the actor ladder. So this is, you know, actor partner model, but this is the actor effect. Then I have my main effect of role. And then I have my interaction of actor ladder with role. And I just write these all out, okay? And then what I've done is I'm gonna break these down um, using the Akin West by multiplying them by these different coefficients. So I know that tutors are one in my data set and students are negative one. So if we wanna know the main effect of role, we're going to have to take that coefficient. We're going to multiply it by one to get the effect for tutors, negative one for students, and then the same thing for the interaction. Okay. And in Aiken and West, what you want to do is multiply something by one standard deviation above and below the mean. Okay. The standard deviation for ladder is 1.70. I just know that from looking at the means. So then we can break this down for our four different groups. Okay. So um, for tutors, we can look at the main effect of ladder on their um, satisfaction. And so what we'd want to do is we take the intercept, we would take the main effect of ladder, we're going to multiply it by one standard deviation above the mean, okay, and that's C. And then we're going to take the main effect of roll. I've already uh, multiplied that by negative one, so by one, I'm sorry. And then we're going to do the same thing for the interaction. We're going to take this interaction effect. I've already multiplied this by one for tutors. And then because ladder is in this one standard deviation above the mean as well. Okay. And then you can play that game um, for all four cells. And so what I did here is I actually graphed this out. This is deceptive. Look at the difference between my, my values and the y-axis. Remember, this isn't significant. Um, tiny, tiny differences. But I did this separately for the actor and separately for the partner. So you guys can pull that up if you want. And then the last thing I wanna show you is, so imagine you did get significant interactions and you wanted to know, well, what's the actor effect for tutors? Is it, is it significant? Is that simple effect significant? You know, what about the actor or partner effect for students? Are those simple effects significant? So the way that you would test this, um, there's a couple ways of testing this. One way of testing this is by first just changing who zero is in the model, who the reference group is. So remember I told you guys that you needed to take the variable tutor 
um, take that variable roll and code it one negative one. Well, what we're going to do to find out what the main effects are for tutors is we're going to take that roll variable and we're going to recode it and we're going to make tutors now zero so that everything in the model refers to them. Okay, so if you multiply any coefficient by zero, it then will give you um, the effects for tutors. So tutors were one for roll. We're now we're going to make them zero. And then I'm going to go ahead and take students who are negative one and make them one. Okay. And then do the same thing for students. So students before were negative one. We're going to now make them zero for this new variable called roll student. We can keep the ones ones. So effectively what you're doing is you're taking that dichotomous variable that was coded one negative one, and you're going to then turn it into two different variables. Role tutor, which makes tutors now zero in the model, and then a new variable called role student, which makes students now, now zero in the model. Now what you're gonna need to do is run this thing twice. So if you wanna get the main effects of actor and partner for the tutors, you're gonna replace that role variable with role tutor, because now tutors are all zero. Okay, so you're gonna go ahead and run that. All I did was literally create these variables and then just change the word role to role tutor um, throughout this model. We can go ahead and run that. And what you'll see here is the interaction effects will stay the same, but the main effects will not. Okay. So because tutors are the reference group, ladder now here, this main effect, this actor effect refers to the actor effect um, for tutors. So it's basically saying um, that for tutors, it's about 0.06. This is what the coefficient is. For every one unit increase in ladder, they're going to go up about 0.06 units in satisfaction. Okay, and then the main effect of partner effect here is tiny, 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 and negative. These values should correspond to what you got in your regression when you actually typed it out in Excel. They should look the same. Okay. So then you can do the identical same thing. This time we're going to replace that role with role student on the exact same model. Now students are a reference group. So the main effects of ladder refer to the main effects for students. Okay. So here we see ladder now, this effect is 0.007. So for every one unit increase in the ladder, students go up about 0.007 units in tutoring satisfaction. This is high, obviously not significant. And then the same thing here. So there's a negative effect. So for every you know, unit increase in ladder, students go down about 0.02 points in their satisfaction. So this is kind of a clunkier way of unpacking interactions using multi-level modeling is just by, if you have a dichotomous variable and you want to look at different levels, what different simple effects for different levels within that dichotomous variable, you treat it as one negative one initially, and then you break it down into zero and one, just using the basic strategy um, of Aiken and West. So I think um, that was all I had. Um, Juana, was there anything that you wanted to clarify or jump in before before you get going? Um, no, I think I can just um, get going and sort of sh show people what I did is I basically mirrored all of the syntax that Tessa has in R um, and yeah, I did the plots as well in R. So um, cool, let me just uh, open up the file. Do I need to hit stop share? I think so, yeah, I don't, yeah. Oh, and before I begin, um, it's, you know, just a like two minute disclaimer. I've said this before, I'm not an expert. I'm still learning all of these things. So if I make mistakes, uh, feel free to point them out in the comments um, or however, email me. Um, and also huge shout out to uh, Dr. Randy Garcia, whose um, syntax I heavily adapted um, from, from the 2018 workshop at UConn. So cool, okay. Um, all right, uh, share screen. Cool, okay. Um, I'm assuming you guys can see my screen now, right? All right, so I'm just gonna pick up where um, Tessa left off, so right here. Um, cool, so I added the syntax for um, multi-level modeling um, using both um, the distinguishable um, model and the indistinguishable model. So you have right here the syntax um, for um, the dyadic analysis treating dyad members is indistinguishable. So this would be the equivalent of using 
um, CSR in SPSS. So one thing to note is in R, actually, one thing that is very helpful um, is you don't actually need to write out all of the main effects and interactions. If you just tell R that you're looking for um, the interaction between roll num and, and ladder now um, centered, it's just going to add the main effects by itself. Um, so if you actually just wanted the interaction, instead of using this uh, little star sign, you would use a um, colon sign. Um, then this NA action, um, it's just saying that um, it, it's going to emit whatever missing values there are. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention is, of course, this is our dependent variable. Whatever predictors you are, um, you are using, you're going to put after this um, tilde, I guess, sign. Is that what it? Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, and so this line right here, it's telling it that it's going to um, correlate the errors uh, for the, the dyads, and it's telling it that it's going to use uh, compound symmetry. And well, then, Anna, yeah. What, what package are you using? Oh, yes. Okay, sorry. I just jumped into everything very quickly. Um, so let me uh, backtrack. Here is the script that you um, guys should have because I emailed you it and it's going to be on the website. So here's a list of packages that you can load. And again, I got this from uh, Randy Garcia's website. Um, so there's a bunch of them that, uh, to be quite honest, I don't exactly know what each and every one of them does, but as long as you have all of them, you should be fine. Um, some of the most important ones are um, the LME4 and uh, dplyr and so on, but just have them all installed. And there, just as a warning, you might run into various issues when you try to install these packages. Usually, if you just Google the error that you're getting, you should be able to, to find out what's going on. Um, yeah, so this is the part where you load the packages right here. And then next in the script is loading the data file. So because you each have different directories, I didn't hard code the directory right here. Instead, I'm directing it to uh, make me choose a file from, um, from my computer. So if I run this, I can just um, go here in the folder and get the file that I need. And notice that I'm using a function called read SPSS. So R can do that, in, provided that you have the, the right packages. Um, even if you don't have SPSS on your computer, if you have a file that is in SPSS format, you can still open it. Okay, um, so now I loaded the file and it shows up right here. And if I wanted to take a look at it, like Tessa showed you in SPSS, um, you, sit, you can either click on it or just run this like view function right here and it's going to show you the same variables. So one thing that happened is because role in my SPSS file had a label, it actually imported it as a string in here. So that's something that I'm going to need to take care of um, just for the sake of consistency to make it one and minus one so, so it's the same as it was in Tessa's syntax. Um, Cool, so to see all of the things that Tessa showed you, like descriptive statistics, you can run this function called uh, favstats. Um, to my knowledge, I don't think there's a way to run it at the same time for like all of these variables. Um, so I have a separate line for each one of them. And then the output is going to show right here. Um, so as Tessa said, you can see that they have the same mean. So overall tutoring one and overall tutoring two have the same mean as same standard deviation and same for ladder one and ladder two. And then if you wanted to see the correlations again and make sure that um, they're not perfectly correlated, same thing, um, you can run this function called core.test. Uh, you can also just use core. Um, that one's not gonna give you p values, which in this case you don't actually need, but it's good to know that if you're looking for significance, you can also run this one. Okay, so one thing I like about R is that, remember in the syntax that Tessa showed you, you had to go and see what the mean for ladder now was and then subtract it, and it was what people call hard coding. Um, so 
when you send that file to someone else, they're going to keep subtracting 6.67 or whatever that number was. Whereas here, whatever variable you replace in here, R is just automatically going to um, figure out its mean and subtract it. So it's like not hard coded, it's e more easily uh, transferable to, um, to other people's uh, data sets. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to center um, the latter variables. And then just if you want to make sure that you did the right thing, you can ask for um, for statistics and make sure that this is, so this is actually zero. Um, it's showing up in scientific notation. If you want to get rid of scientific notation, you just have to run this line of code right here and then run that again. This is as close to zero as possible. Um, okay, so remember how I said now I have the role uh, variable as a string. The next thing I'm going to do is transform it into um, a number. So we had one for tutors and minus one for students. Um, and so I'm creating a new variable called role num um, that is essentially going to take um, whoever is coded as a tutor and um, create a variable that is one for uh, whoever tutor and minus one for whoever student. So I ran that. Okay, and so now we finally get to the syntax uh, part that I started with. Um, so for the indistinguishable model, actually for all of the models that we're going to use, you can use the function um, GLS. So it uses generalized uh, least squares um, to correlate the errors for um, the dyad members. So here is the dependent variable, it's overall tutoring. As I said, if you just mentioned this interaction right here, um, it's also going to add the main effects. And then this is telling it the correlation and here's where it's telling it that um, you're grouping them by dyad. So this is essentially telling it that you have a random intercept for every dyad. Um, cool. And so in R, everything that you run, like every model, you're going to assign to an object. So in this case, you're assigning this model to this object that I called indistinguishable model. So after I run this, it's not going to print anything because I haven't asked it to. Um, but if I run summary on this object, it's going to show all of this output. Um, so my guess is, and I'm not 100% sure, but I think this is this essentially the same um, log likelihood that Tessa was talking about, except in SPSS, it's actually multiplied by minus two. That's probably why it's called minus two, uh, but I'm, I can't, I'm not 100% sure. Um, this is the row that we, that Tessa showed you earlier, which is the um, ICC. Um, and here you have the estimates of the fixed effects. So here you have the intercept, um, the, the effective role, ladder, and um, the interaction. And the p-values, which here again, uh, nothing is significant, same model. Um, here you get the, uh, the correlations and, sorry, I'm kidding. Should I answer check, chat questions? Okay, I'll, I'll I'll yeah, don't, sorry, don't worry about it. I'm seeing them. I think you can answer when you're done. Okay, cool. Um, cool, yeah, so this is the equivalent of um, using CSR. Um, if you actually go to the Google Doc that I sent you, you'll see that the numbers are, um, are the same. One thing that is important to mention, and I have this in the slides, is that R um, actually doesn't use fractional degrees of freedom in the denominator. Um, it uses within and between degrees of freedom. So sometimes the p-values might be like off on like the fourth decimal or something. Um, but that being said, R's uh, way of doing it, if I understand it correctly, is more conservative. So if you get significance in R, you, you should, it also, sh it also shouldn't be like very different. They should be almost the same. Um, Cool. Okay, so that was the the treating them as indistinguishable. If you want to uh, treat them as distinguishable, so have the equivalent of CSH. Um, the one thing that you need to add is this um, syntax line right here, where you're telling it that you're going to identify the variables um, by their role. Um, I actually used role in here. I could have used partnum. It just occurred to me that I could have done that. Um, but whichever variable you use, 
doesn't matter as long as it's um, the one that's distinguishing um, the, the two dive members. Okay, so if I run this one, and then I do summary, Yep, so here again, uh, log likelihood is right here. Fixed effects are right here. And so these, the p-values are like the same, like there's no significance um, still, but you'll notice that the estimates are like a little, um, a little different. Um, but yeah, that's, this is the equivalent of CSH. And if you look at the output, it should match um, almost exactly with the one in SPSS. And then there's, let me just go back to the slide for a second. Okay, yeah. So this is a distinguishable model. Yeah, as I said, there's something to be said about the degrees of freedom. And then there's also, there are also alternatives in R, um, like the packages LME and LMER. Um, so these are also used for multi-level modeling and this is the equivalent uh, syntax. To my knowledge, and I might be wrong, um, both of these, at least in the syntax that is right here, treat dyads as indistinguishable. Um, so I'm sure there's some setting to make them treat them as distinguishable, but I'm, um, I haven't found it yet. Um, and some important things to know about it is if you do go on to like use these for other multi-level models, um, LME only accepts nested random effects, um, LMER handles cross random effects, um, and there's all sorts of differences. One thing to note is that LMER doesn't um, give you p-values, and there's a whole blog about why. Um, so if you're interested, feel free to read that. But as far as dyadic data analysis goes, using GLS is, um, should give you pretty much the same results as using LME and um, LMER. Um, cool, okay, so just for demonstration purposes, I'm also gonna run these two. So if you look at the, out, so this is LMER, which notice that it's not giving you um, p-values right here, it's only giving you the t-statistic, um, but it should, if you look at the, the t-statistics, it, um, it should be the same as when you, uh, when you run the indistinguishable um, model with GLS. Okay, so now um, to run the actor partner interdependence model, which is the equivalent of what Tessa did earlier, where instead of just having um, the actor ladder, we're also adding the, um, the partner ladder. Yes. Um, so, sorry, I just realized that, notice how I had a colon here. Um, actually, that's correct. Oops, sorry. Um, here it is. So this is the actor partner interdependence model. The only thing I'm doing is instead of just having this as before, I'm just um, I'm now going to add the interaction between role and uh, partner ladder. And so this again is automatically going to add the main effect of partner ladder uh, by itself. Um, and then the uh, correlation is still compound symmetry. I'm still telling it that they're grouped by dyad, um, and I'm treating them as um, distinguishable mainly because I talked to Tessa and she told me that the CSH model fit better. <laughs> um, so I didn't actually calculate that for this, but, um, but if you had, it you would have gotten the same um, results. So if I run this and then I look at the summary. Okay, so here it is. Um, now we have the main effect of ladder one, ladder two, and then the interaction between uh, role in ladder one and then role in ladder two. And so one nice thing, so remember how Tessa was talking about these effects and then uh, we were talking about how we know that um, students are coded as minus one. So if we wanted to um, figure out the effect for students, we would multiply this by minus one. Um, R actually has a nice um, way to just show you those effects, even though it, you know, it's, it's pretty easy to multiply by one and minus one, but uh, if you wanted to visualize that, if you run this, um, this syntax where basically what you're doing is you're subtracting one um, from the model, um, it's going to give you 
the actual effects. Um, so here it's telling you the effect for um, student, the effect for tutor. Um, here it's telling you the effect for the effect of ladder on students, the effect of ladder on tutors, ladder one that is, and then ladder two on students, and then ladder two on tutors. Um, so it's just a nicer way to sort of visualize defects without having to constantly multiply. Okay, so now um, the last part of this is pretending that there was an interaction um, that we would like to decompose and as Tessa did, I'm going to create two different variables, one, one called role tutor that's coded as zero for tutors and one for students, and the other one called role student that's coded as um, zero for students and one for tutors. So if I run this syntax, so now we are essentially going to run the same syntax from the first actor partner interdependence model and as Tessa did we're going to replace role with role student um, and role tutor. So let's do this for the um, for the student first and then if I run the summary this is um, going to be the equivalent of what Tessa just showed you in um, SPSS. And then if you look at the uh, lower order effect, which is this, you'll see this would be the um, effect of ladder one on students since they are the reference group. All right, and then you can do the same thing for tutors right here. And same thing again, here you would have the um, the effect of ladder one on um, on to, on just tutors. Um, okay, cool. So that is it for in terms of like syntax um, that is equivalent to what we just showed. Again, if you go to the Google Doc, you can find them side by side and sort of compare. And feel free to let me know if something doesn't match up. Um, and then the last part of this is um, plotting the interaction. So of course you can still do the Aiken and West um, procedure in Excel. You can still take the coefficients um, and do that, but there's um, potentially simpler ways to do it in R um, if you know the right packages or Google them enough. Um, so this is syntax for instance, uh, where what I'm doing is I'm creating a uh, regression model predicting overall tutoring from um, ladder now and role. So I'm just creating this new object that I'm going to plot. Um, and then I'm telling it to plot this. And um, what it's going to do is it's automatically going to create the low and high uh, ladders by itself without me having to like subtract or add in Excel. Um, so I'm actually going to be plotting these with. Um, ladder on the x-axis and um, tutor and student as separate lines. In general, it's, it's I, think, I think it's easier to plot things in R uh, with uh, continuous variables on the x-axis and then um, categorical variables as different lines. So that's like kind of the automatic thing that it does. Um, but I'm going to show you how to do it to exactly mirror what Tessa did in Excel too. Um, Okay. Yeah, okay, here it is. Um, yep, so if you look at this, um, you should be able to see, sorry, I just keep opening things. Um, you should be able to see the um, red line, which is the students, and then uh, the blue line, which is the tutors. And this is um, essentially uh, being low on the ladder, and this is being high on the ladder. Um, so, should be pretty straightforward. It does look like there would be a difference here, but there's not. Um, and then you can do the same thing. Um, so again, this is for ladder now, which is the actor ladder. And then you can do the same thing for partner ladder. So if I do this, yeah. So if I do the same thing, uh, this is for partner ladder. So these are Right here, you have um, students whose partners are low in status, and here you have students whose partners are high in status. 
um, and same for tutors. All right, and so finally, if you wanted to um, switch these around and instead of having student and tutor here as separate lines, you wanted to have um, people who are low in, in status and people who are high in status and then have student and tutor on the x-axis, um, you can use this code that is slightly complicated and um, that I have to give credit to Jenny Chu Lee for. Thank you. Um, that essentially is going to um, reverse the axes. Um, and it actually looks pretty nice um, if, if it shows up. Yeah, so there it is. This is the equivalent of what um, Tessa showed you. So minus one in this case is students and one is tutors. Um, there's a bunch of things that you can do in ggplot to um, change these, uh, these values right here and get them to be prettier and change the title and so on. Um, I, didn't, I didn't actually do that this time, but there's just know that this can be changed for sure. Um, but yeah, here you have uh, people who are high in ladder, um, who students who are high in ladder, and then um, tutors who are high in ladder, and so on. Um, okay, so that was it. I also, so I, I'm not sure I have, I'm going to go through this, but I also included syntax for how to do um, basically the, the indistinguishable model in Python 2. So this is one of the files that you guys should have gotten. It's very straightforward. It's essentially just translating all of the syntax into um, how you could use it in Python. And so one thing I really like about it is that um, I already ran it, but it's compared to R, it's, it's just a little more like tidy. It's just pretty, it aligns everything. Um, so it's, I, I like it because I'm, I really like design, but needless to say, you don't need to, um, to know this in all of these packages. It's just, if you've decided that you want to go with R, you can stick with R. I personally lately have been interested in Python, so it's just nice to know that there's ways to do this um, in Python as well. Juana, can you just spend just like two quick minutes maybe walking through the Python um, code, just really briefly? Yeah. yeah, so this, again, these are a bunch of packages. Um, all of the statistical analyses in Python will come from the stats models um, package, so this is the one that's like essential to have. Um, and then here I'm reading in the data file. Again, um, you can also just like this, you'll have to change this depending on your directory. And then here you're telling it that you have a mixed model. So this is the equivalent of um, what we did in R. Um, the syntax is actually very similar um, in that you use the same like tilde sign. Um, I haven't actually explored to see if this, um, asterisk or like star right here does the same thing. So I just wrote all of the main effects and the interaction this time. Um, and then here is where you're telling it that um, your, your data is um, in dyadic format, essentially. Th this could be anything. Like if this, if you had a group um, that was like five people or like however many people, it doesn't need to be dyad. But in my case, the variable is named um, dyad. And so um, I like to run, run Python from the uh, terminal, which is, um, it's pretty straightforward. All you have to do is make sure that you're in the right directory. So I'm in my documents directory right now. Um, to check if you're in the right directory, you can do pwd and it tells you where you are. And so all you have to do is write Python 3, which is telling it what, the, um, what program to use and then tell it the, um, the file name, which in my case is dyad underscore Python. And yeah, and here it is. It's essentially doing the same thing, uh, giving us the uh, coefficients, p values, uh, confidence intervals log the likelihood, which if you remember, this was the same. So um, this is the equivalent of doing um, indistinguishable dyads. Um, again, there might be some sort of syntax for treating them as distinguishable. I have to look into that, but um, 
as far as I know, this is the equivalent of what we've done so far for um, indistinguishable. Cool, okay. Sorry, I keep opening things. Um, all right, so I guess, um, I think that was pretty much it. Um, I'm, I think people have questions because I see the chat is like, something's happening in there. Um, so maybe I'll, like, we can do that now or? Yeah, that sounds good. Do we wanna, so thanks, Juana, that was super clear. Um, do we wanna maybe stop record and then start take, start going through the chat? Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Um, yeah, if that's, I think that's it for what we had in terms of like lecturing, so. Yeah, so just to remind everyone, all the materials are available on um, tessawestlab.com, including all the data files, syntax, PowerPoint presentations, and so forth. Um, and then we'll also upload this video at some point um, on there as well. If you guys wanna share it with people, feel free to tell whoever they want to check it out, so yeah. Cool. Okay, so we can stop the recording then. All right.